I just want to, we're going to vote no on some of the changes that they're talking about to the ordinance. Otherwise, this conversation is going to come up again in two years or three years, whatever we extend it. Some type of, some of the discussion will be, well, when a new business comes into town, they have a pole sign. That might be the time that the new owner would have to put up a monument sign where the existing owner will not have to, right, unless, or if the sign becomes in disrepair, other options. But all there was, you want to make a comment? I'm them. sorry, Chairman. No, go ahead. Let the, okay, let, let them yes. And then I'll, okay, I'll throw we'll let. Uh, uh, my name is Tony Trotto. I've been a resident of Wooddale for 25 years now. I own business property at 130, 134, and 138 West Irving Park Road. Uh, when I was informed uh, about this situation, um, I drove around the city and I prepared a petition and presented it to our business community. And I can say that I was successful in two short days of getting 27 businesses to sign this petition. Um, just so you understand, each one that I contacted signed the petition. You, you have to speak in the microphone. And, and here we go. It's, it's being broadcast. All right. And I tend to move around, too, so sorry. Um, but I do have the petition signed here. And uh, what I got from the business community, and I think one of our big concerns is, when this ordinance was passed in 2006, we do realize, and I appreciate your comments, the economy was booming at that time. We do understand that. And we've been in a slow recovery since about 2008, 2009. In 2010, I'm sure you've all read this. This is the Unified Development Ordinance, 389 pages. I just want to read, I'm not going to read all of it, believe me. I just would like to refer to one paragraph. And these were your comments. As one drives through Wooddale, one characteristic that becomes obvious is the community's diversity of buildings and land uses. The city's slow ev evolution over its history has led to a rich mix of use, scale, height, and parcel size. Diversity is part of the city's character and a strong asset. Diversity reduces the monotony of sameness often associated with contemporary development practices and is critical to preserving Wooddale's character. The only thing I disagree with what her comments were is I would ask that you revisit, do we really need monument signs? Monument signs merely tell someone you've arrived someplace. When you go to a grave and you want to find a grave, there's a monument. <laughs> But if you're looking for a business, if you want to find a special business when you're driving westbound and you cross the creek, his sign comes into view because it's over the bushes. If you're going to force that gentleman to put in a monument sign, no one's going to see it. That's the diversity of our community. We have different lot sizes. We have different frontages. We have a different situation. If you read through your own ordinance, which you wrote in 2006, you talk about the fact that you do not want monument, or monument signs blocking driveways. I invite you to please take a walk from Irving Park Road and Wooddale Road on the south side of the street, one short block from Wooddale Road to Oakwood. Count the driveways. There's nine of them, nine driveways. If you start putting monument signs there, you're going to have cars creeping back and forth, not seeing the pedestrians, the commuters going to work, the kids coming home from school. You're just going to create more problems than you're curing. Please, in 2010, you got it right. You hit a home run. This is a diverse community. It's a diverse business district. We are not a business park. If you drive around a business park, you'll see monument signs because everything is the same. We're not the same. There may be businesses here that may want a monument sign because of the location of trees, 
but I would hope that you would cooperate with that. But there are others that because of the location of their business, they need to have a pole sign or no one's gonna see it. Also keep in mind, Irving Park Road is a busy road. It's a four lane highway and there's a lot of truck traffic. If you have a semi on the inside lane and you're in the middle lane and you're trying to locate a business and all there are are monument signs, you're not gonna see anything. Now we have Prairie Fest coming up. I, I noticed there's some signs up on there. Where did the staff put those signs? They put them on a pole about 20 feet high. Why? So people could see them. They understand that when you're driving, you have a sight line. And if you don't have a sign up a certain height, you're not going to see it. So please, take that into consideration. This was in 2006. You now have a plan. If you go to our website, you go to the, the website and you click on the mayor, what the mayor says, what is your number one goal that you want to accomplish uh, during his term? The revitalization of Irving Park Road. I submit to you that you don't start with the signs. You end with the signs. Let's fix up Irving Park Road, and then we'll get those signs in there. If you're going to stay on that website, there's another thing you need to do is take a look at the videos. One of the videos that you have promotes the fact that you state that this is a pro-business community. And then you show a sign at least twice, and I may be mispronouncing it, it's Hegeli Logistics. They're a non-conforming sign. So what are you telling to the business community? Come into our community, and we're going to make you take that sign down? Please, reconsider the entire ordinance. Go up and down Irving Park Road. Work with the business people, because they want to work with you. And let's see what's going to work for each individual. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Those are the petitions. You want to pass those down to the clerk? Oh, it's a copy for each. Okay. Anybody else on that subject? Go ahead. Uh, on that subject and also on another one. I would love to thank the Woodell Police Department for as helpful as they've been with us throughout the years because we had a couple robberies and they've always been so so good. And I know everybody gets a bad rap. Excuse me. It's always nice to have a good thing. Could you state your name? Oh, sorry. Roger Dickens, White Glove in the Hairport, 354, 356 Irving, and 345 to 348 Potter. We have recently spent over $10,000 in redoing our landscape, some brickwork, things like that. We would like to spend a few thousand dollars more to revamp our sign. We were gonna change out the insert and just beautify it. But we're not feeling comfortable not knowing what's gonna happen with the sign, so we would just love to have some closure on it to know what our next step should be before we invest four or $5,000 and then take it down and invest another 20. That was my only point. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, my name is Sam Lewiton. Um, the building location is 133, uh, I'm sorry, 333 North Wooddale Road as a monument sign. In looking at the cost of reconstructing the sign, I find out that to get to a monument sign, which is going to show various businesses at that location, you're going to have to have signs that will flash one name, then another name, because the size of the sign that is allowed by ordinance is not large enough to put the 10 names of the 10 residents, business residents of the community that are there. That means that to go from the type of sign that's up there to the type of sign that you're proposing, you need more amperage. I have an estimate from a sign company, and you don't have to do the sign at the same time you do the electrical upgrades. You can do the electrical upgrades in 2012, and you could put a monument sign in in 2013 or 2014. Just to upgrade to 30 amps 
is $5,177. We're not even talking about the cost of the sign. We're talking about the cost of digging into the earth and, and laying new cable from the building to the sign. Now, you've talked about, the gentleman who was up here before, talked about unfunded mandates. And I know that in 2006, uh, Mike Malone wrote a letter saying that there shouldn't be unfunded mandates to the, to the council. And I noticed that the council, generous as it is, has funded uh, uh, generators for individuals. I think that if you're going to fund for individuals, you should fund for businesses. They should be considered as equal partners in the city. I know that you've done funding for uh, improvements. Um, Christie's, Fran knows. Um, that was done 18 years ago. There was a major contribution by the city to improve the outlook of the city's driveway at that time, Irving Park Road. Most of us are not necessarily opposed to going to, to other signs, um, but we do know that it's very expensive. Also, the lower size of it would necessitate, necessitate getting better visibility. That would mean, in our case, having to take down the two shade trees where the uh, crossing guards sit in order to get a view of the sign, which would be much lower than it is. So in conclusion, I would point out it's a high cost for upgrading the electrical conduit from the building to the sign. It increases, uh, I should have said, it decreases the visibility from the street to the sign. And if to, to have visibility from the south to the north, you would have to remove the trees in order for the people to who are driving to be able to see the sign. And there are, as it is, it's the, the, the ordinance hardly permits all of the people whose businesses are on the sign as it is. Right now we have Samco Agency, we have Pat's Place, um, we have uh, Dotson Grocery, we have the Chinese uh, New China Pearl Restaurant, and we have Dr. Kellner on the sign, but we don't have as it is right now, we don't have the karate school. Um, we don't have the uh, um, quick auto loan company on the sign. There just isn't even enough space. And the new ordinance, when you put in the new monument sign, it's going to be smaller. It's going to be smaller than the sign is now, which means it'll even have fewer names on a permanent basis. And that's why you would have to go to a flashing sign. I thank you very much for listening to me. I'm not trying to demand anything or, or anything in, in a derogatory way. I just want you to know, if you're reconsidering it, consider the economic impact and what it will take to, for, the, for the people who run the property to keep up with the cost of it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Mr. Mullo. I'm uh, Mike Malone. I own Wooddale Bowl, and I'm the treasurer of the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, just a couple things I'd like to mention because I worked on the sign ordinance with the City Council in 1998. I worked on it with them in 2006. And um, it's been a long time that you guys have wanted monument signs or some cohesive sign look in the town. But the timing of this to finally, after 18 years, to try to enforce it now in these economic times, like Dolores said, um, it's, it's almost devastating to some of these businesses. There's, there's more than, well, it depends how you look at it because some of them are grandfathered by... Um, the shopping center description when they were built, but there's there's anywhere from 40 to 51 businesses that are going to be directly affected by 
the imp implementation of this ordinance. And, and just on average, if I know 10 or 15 years ago, when I turned mine into a monument sign, it was $9,000. Now, I'm sure costs have gone up in the last 10 years on doing that. And I, I hesitate to say what the average might be, but you got, you're, you're asking for well over a half a million dollars in signage to be put up by these businesses. So um, your idea of extending it is a good idea, um, mainly because it's a terrible economy out there right now. Um, secondly, the idea of working with the businesses to come up with some sort of conclusion of how you can get there, because you do have a goal and you've had it for a long time to, to beautify Irving Park and signage might help you, but you have to get there finally. So, so you need to work with these businesses and make, make them aware and make sure they know every step of the way where we're, we're going and when we want to get there. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I hate to say this, but maybe, maybe if you really want those signs that bad, maybe you should buy them and have them pay you back over a period of time just to get it done. Because it, it, it's not easy out there right now. So I don't know if tourism funds uh, qualify for that, but uh, you guys would know better than I would. But uh, maybe that's a way you can go. But you need to actually pick those people and not just let this go another three years if you extend it that long. And then at the end of three years, we're all going to be back in this room again saying the same stuff. And um, we never seem to get anywhere when we do that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Alderman Woods. Yeah, first I'd like to first I'd like to thank all the business owners for coming down. I was one of the uh, aldermen that pushed not uh, prolonging, let's say, the inevitable. Uh, but that wasn't to wield a big hammer over the business owners' heads. That was to draw this to a conclusion that we can move forward positively. And if that means talking to the businesses to develop the plan or a better plan and talking to Mr. Trotto, Mr. Warnamont, uh, the other young man business owner had a, uh, a good thing too in that nobody knows what to do because they don't know what the city's gonna do. And that's part of the problem of us moving forward. So if we just push this forward another two years, we're gonna have exactly this same conversation in two years. I think we need to uh, and I think that that's what we're going to do is to table this, take it back to committee, talk to the business owners, uh, and develop uh, a slightly different concept, albeit similar to what we have now, and entertain some of the options that uh, Mr. Malone just brought up uh, in an effort to help the business owners through the bad times uh, and carry out what it is the ultimate goal of the city is and the council, and I'm sure all the business owners, and that's to enhance the city. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Roy Wesley. Um, last week, I was, uh, I, I was in favor of not going to Monument and doing the extension and stuff. You know, I walked down Irving Park Road. I walked down Irving Park Road and Mr. Trotto's property, from his building to the sidewalk, is exactly eight feet. If you put a monument sign there, and he has eight feet, and he has a driveway on both sides, you can't put a, a sign there. It's impossible. You wouldn't see it, like Mr. Trotto said. And you know, we sit up here about business and stuff. We, we've been hearing more and more that governments get involved with business. Why don't we leave the business people alone and let them do what they want? And they'll get us out of this recession somehow, some way. It's the small business that made this country, and it's the small business that will get us out of this country, get, get out of the recession here. So I'm looking for a long period of time for extension. If we I would really like to repeal this, but I don't think it's going to happen because some businesses already did it, and it's not fair to them that they did, they did the did the thing, but are we looking for monument on every single property? I know Crossroads doesn't have any property there to put a monument sign. He needs a post sign. If he doesn't have a sign, he'll probably be out of business. And there's no way that I'm going to sit up here and, 
and hurt the small business in any which way. And if it's to revise the, the sign ordinance where it ha doesn't have to be monument, so be it. We got to make it, you know, I understand we're trying to beautify the city and make it nice and everything else. But, you know, sometimes a monument sign is not what it is. And we're not the city of Chicago. We're not Addison. We're Wooddale. We're a small community. And the people like it how it is. And we need to justify it to them. So I don't think I'm going to get a repeal on this. I'm not going to go for a repeal because it's not, it's not going to be fair to those, those businesses. But I like to hear the, what the other council member feels about a long period of, of extension on this. That'll be a discussion at committee. So we're not, we're not going to. And the manager's already made a note. But we're not going to do a, we're not going to do an extension now. Not tonight. Basically, no. No. what was passed last week is going to be killed, and basically the extension, if I understand correctly, is going to Mr. Bond. Yeah. What you'll do at uh, committee is you'll determine the uh, the length of the uh, extension uh, for the amortization, and you'll also uh, d discuss, as the uh, mayor and alderman Winger indicated, conditions. For example, if the property is sold, that should be a condition where then a uh, uh, the sign should be changed if there's a change in the business on that property. So you as a council or as a, at the committee level will determine what those conditions are. Those conditions then will be incorporated into the, the uh, amortization of whatever period of time you decide to extend that. So in that, in that regards, right. since we have all the businesses that are non-conforming for these, these signs, when we have this on committee, I take it the city of Wooddale will send them a notice that this is going to be talked about? We can do that, Mr. Manager. So they're well informed and, th and they could have their input onto it? I just don't want it set at the committee level because not all of us here own businesses. And we don't know, we might not know what they need. So I want their input too. I'll be honest with you. I had a business in town. I didn't say. And, <laughs> and when I heard of, at the time when they passed the ordinance, we already did not have the business any longer, but I'm like, monument sign? Who's going to see it from the street? <laughs> I didn't like it, but I know there was big discussion on this, many, many meetings. So this will go to committee. We'll, we'll fix it. Uh, did, are we go ahead. are we gonna send notices to the business? Yes, the manager already said yes. He already nodded yes. That okay. we'll be I didn't see I of. didn't see him because he's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Woods, you had something else to say? I was just gonna reiterate what uh, Alderman Wesley said. It, it's imperative that the businesses are involved because um, develop a plan that we're not gonna execute. It's frustrating to me, and I'm sure everybody else out there. So I welcome the help ironing out the kinks in that system, and hopefully we can develop a time frame and maybe something monetarily to make this all work. Thank you. Nothing further. Roll call. Mr. Bond. Yeah. The motion is in the affirmative. The motion is to approve the change in the assignment amortization Contained in the city code. Uh, if you reject that, it'd be a, a vote to no, and that would send it then back to committee for an extension of the amortization with conditions. So if you do not want the uh, sign to be implemented, the sign code to be implemented and enforced immediately, you would vote no. Basically, voting no. So, but go ahead. You mentioned some things about change of business and stuff. Is that still in a no, or is that just to go to committee? Mr. Bond. That's just to go to committee. That is not part of the motion. Okay, because I want, I want their input 100%. Right. 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 Yeah. We have a motion, a second. Yeah, a motion, a second, and a roll call. Roll call. Okay. Alderman Winger. No. Alderman R. Wesley. No. Alderman Coles. No. 
Alderman Woods. No. Alderman Szymarski. No. Alderman E. Wesley. No. Alderman Lazara. No. Motion fails. Okay. Motion fails. Yeah, it, Mr. Ban, um, it's my understanding that I will make a second motion now uh, directing no. discussion at committee. You simply would make a motion to ask that the uh, matter be taken up at committee for a uh, discussion of uh, amortization of signs and, and the appropriate conditions. Okay, then uh, that is my motion. Second. Alderman. All right. Alderman Wesley. You my question is, are we looking at the next committee meeting or are we looking at a couple of weeks out where we can notify these businesses? Mr. Manager, we could produce a letter out there that quick in a week. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna need some time to consolidate um, all of our thoughts, gather opinions, talk to everybody. It'll be it'll be a little time. September. I'm not even gonna give a date. Yep. Mr. Wesley. You know, could we throw this to committee maybe six months to a year? I mean, we're still in a recession. No. <laughs> I gotta throw it out to try. <sighs> time is time. Uh, I'm not winning. I get Alderman Coles. How about sometime in September? It'll be nicer weather and it'll be a little cooler out and yeah. we'll have a nice clear heads. The, so the motion sometime in September, do you think you can arrange that? We we don't need to pick it right now, and actually, the manager no, doesn't the manager doesn't even feel he's going to be ready in September, oh. so it might even be pushed to October. October. Uh, we'll Fine. leave it up to the manager and make sure the businesses are notified. In, we don't want it in December when there's a snowstorm and then nobody shows up. <laughs> no, we won't do that. Okay. okay, you have your. There's a motion, a second. Anything else on the question? Then um, it, I would say, will the minute taker please call the roll? Alderman Weir? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Coles? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. That it motion passes. does pass. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, next item is the uh, next item. I do make a motion to a resolution implementing policy changes to the city's stormwater and floodplain management ordinance to reflect the minimum standards adopted in the DuPage County Countywide Stormwater and Floodplain Ordinance revised by the County of DuPage effective April 25, 2012. Second. Any questions on that? Roll call. Alderman, <clears throat> Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Coles? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman e. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Lazaro. Yes. That passes. And that does conclude my report. Thank you. Public Health and Safety, Alderman Coles. I have three items. <laughs> One is an ordinance to repealing the ordinance 0 09 35, prohibiting video gambling within the corporate limits of the city of Wooddale. Is that Do your I motion? Have a second. That's your motion? That's my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Butis, you wish to be recognized on this still? <laughs> now, now's the time if you want to speak on. Anybody who's here for video poker? I'm Joe Butis. I'm living in Woodale, 156 Oakwood Drive. Been here since 1958 in Wooddale. Anyway, I'm here for the uh, representing the VFW Club in Wooddale, and uh, we are looking for the city here to allow us to have the video gaming machines, which the state uh, will, be, will be controlling. Everything is fed into the state. We don't even uh, touch the money as far as I can uh, understand from our, our uh, suppliers. So it, uh, it's, uh, for us, it's a necessary thing. It's going to help us uh, with our business because we are low in business right now because of the economy. Our club is hurting, and we'd like to have the uh, opportunity to you, opportunity to get these video machines. It's, and it's going to help us quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butis. Anybody else on that subject? Uh, 
I'm Jim Bender. I've lived in Wooddale since 77 on Dalewood Avenue. I own JB's on Irving Park. And the video gambling, I think, is necessary for our businesses to compete. Arlington Heights just switched over. Elk Grove just, well, not Arlington, Elk Grove. I mean, people can drive up the street to video gamble if they want. I guess uh, in between, Bensonville's got it. They can go a mile down the road if they want to play. Why should we be at a competitive disadvantage? We sell lotto tickets. You can go buy $100 worth at the smoke shop. Uh, state's going to run it, regulate it. We don't touch the money, as the other gentleman said. So I think we need it because businesses, Mr. Trotto said it's starting to pick up. Well, it could have fooled me. Well, you want to take more money from everybody, right? Thank, you, Thank you, sir. Mike Malone from Wooddale Bowl. And, um, I, th I think anybody with a liquor license in a bar knows that since 2008, we're down big time. And um, this is another source of revenue that, that we can have available to us. Um, when the next towns next to you have it and you don't, it can be a deterrent for them staying in Wooddale, which is where we want them to spend their money. Um, Bensonville, like you said, and Elk Grove are not far away. Um, the the video uh, poker, from what I'm told, uh, it's going to be low enough bets, and and the way it's regulated, it's 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 just not going to be the horror story that people imagine it to be. Uh, I I see people play the lottery machines right now with the instant tickets, um, as if they were video gaming and. They aren't a problem, so I, I don't anticipate these machines being a problem. I, I anticipate them being a good source of revenue for the businesses, somewhat a good source of revenue for the city and the state. So um, I say see what happens. You guys have the, the license to pull the cord because if you don't have a liquor license and you're not a pouring establishment, you can't have the machines. So, so final say-so probably still goes in your pocket as far as if you don't like the way it's being handled. But I, I say give us a chance to show you that we can get the machines and we can run them in, in a manner that you would be fine with. So that's all I can tell you. Thank you. Any questions from Alderman Eugene Wesley? Mr. Pat Bond, um, a legal question for you. A couple weeks ago I asked if we have any leverage with this video poker mm -hmm. Thing that we are trying to get past here. Your response to me is no, we don't we have to follow the state guidelines. An article yesterday in the Daily Herald uh, displays past ordinance putting a limit on violations that the city put a violation on. If someone violates it, it was like a $2,300 fine for first, $3,000 or second. The other question is they also, in that ordinance, also drafted. The, the license come to the city of Wooddale and the city of Wooddale or, or the town of Desplaines get the license and they issue the license to businesses. That will be us a better control of a license because if we have a violation out there of a liquor license that had violation of serving for minors for two or three times, we already got problems with that liquor license already. Now, my question to Ms. Legal Opinion is, is, is does that still your comment, does it still say is that we don't have authority to pass an ordinance in our own level and to impose those penalties? And also there was a $25 fee for any business that wanted it that came to the city for those machines. I ain't saying that I want the $25 fee, but the point is where I might concern is that if they get caught with a minor or if they get caught doing it at 19 or 20, you know, and they're in there with their parents at a, at a restaurant that has a bar or, a, you know, other places. How do we address that issue? And, and I believe the last statement is we have to obey by the state guidelines on this. I have a hard time doing that when another town does it and we don't have authority to do our own ordinance like that. So could someone ask? I'll respond question? first okay. and then pass it over to you. Actually, we already had a discussion with the police chief, the manager, Mr. Bond. Me personally, I want to make sure that 
we don't have any shenanigans going on in town with minors at the slot machines. And I asked, can we do a $3,500 fine if somebody's caught with a minor at the machine? First time, second time, double the fine, third time, basically, they lose their liquor license and they're done. I was told that is a yes. Mr. Bond can give you the legal explanation. Yeah, the state statute provides that the, uh, the video gaming is regulated by the state. And so you are not able to impose any, uh, any restrictions more severe or stringent than the state. Uh, what you do have the authority to do is to issue licenses and the license fee is set forth in the statute and that is $25, that goes to the uh, city. If there's a violation of it, there's a provision for suspending that license. The real enforcement, as the mayor indicated, though, is as a precondition for a video gaming machine to be licensed, it has to be in a facility, and there's a ca category of facilities. It has to be a uh, licensed establishment that is, uh, has a valid liquor license, and that includes fraternal organizations, uh, veterans organizations, and so on and so forth. And so if there is a violation, if someone violates the statute, that constitutes a violation of their liquor license. And as a violation of their liquor license, the mayor in his capacity as a local liquor commissioner has the authority to revoke, suspend, or fine the uh, liquor license establishment. So while your enforcement does not come through the state statute where you can implement some additional code enforcement, it does come through the regular enforcement, because if it's a crime, the police can go ahead and issue uh, violations for those. But the real teeth come in the mayor's power to be able to revoke or suspend and to implement fines with respect to the liquor license. And that's what the other towns have done. It made the newspapers sort of blended into their own, their ordinance. So you don't have the authority in your ordinance to implement those fines, because that's not set forth in the statute. And you can't fine them for violating those types of fines for violating the Video Gaming Act, you can impose those fines for violating the terms and conditions of their liquor license, and those are much more stringent, much more severe fines than you're going to find in the Video Gaming Act anyway. So you have that enforcement uh, authority, and the mayor's indicated that it's going to be his uh, intent to uh, treat those very seriously. I think there was a discussion at the committee level where there would, with the uh, application, there would be a letter from the mayor in his capacity as the local liquor commissioner that he deems any violations of the, uh, of the liquor license provision, including video gaming violations, to be serious and may lead up to uh, the possibility of suspension or revocation of license and uh, significant fines. So that's how the city has the, the uh, teeth that they can regulate this, uh, this video gaming, but you can't do it straight through the Video Gaming Act. Excuse me. The chief's name will also be on that. Uh, basically, the letter is going to state the fines. Going to state that the chief is going to do continued, you know, inspections. Uh, the other thing that I want to make sure is, if we do this, that the money that comes from this goes towards our facade program or some type of beautification. Who knows? Maybe some signs or something. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but. We should make that a specific line item on where that money's going to go and get used. Alderman Roy Wesley, you had your hand up first. And then over. Um, Pat, you mentioned about, um, I want to use like uh, a restaurant. We do have some restaurants that do sell liquor there. And what's not saying a 10 year or 15 year old kids are going to say, well, dad, give me a couple bucks and just boom there it goes mr bond yeah the act requires that the uh, area that contains a video uh, gaming machine has to be segregated uh, from the uh, general public and has to have a re, uh, re age restriction anyone under the age of 21 is prohibited from being there that entrance the segregated entrance to that area has to be within visual control of the uh, manager of the facility uh, they have to be able to see that uh, that entryway, and the person has to be over the age of 21 uh, who's monitoring that. If they don't, as the mayor said, it's a police chief uh, will be doing uh, not only compliance checks, but also like they do with other uh, businesses, uh, 
making sure that they're in compliance with the uh, act. If they don't, if they are, if a 15 year old were to be found in there, that would be a violation of state statute. That would be prosecuted by the uh, state's attorney's office. That would also be a violation of the terms and conditions of their liquor license. That would be prosecuted by the city before the uh, mayor in his capacity as a liquor commissioner. Mr. Wesley. Let me go a little further on that. Jewel carries a liquor license. They don't pour. Mr. Bond. Yeah, it has to be, has, it has has to be, be for service uh, at the establishment. So packaged liquor uh, uh, facilities are not eligible to, to receive a, uh, a video gaming device. Alderman Woods. Yeah, are all those things pre-written out, whatever the fines are? I know you said, you, you know, is that going to, in the form of a, a statute, an ordinance, or just a piece of paper the mayor passes out and says, I'm probably going to do this? And then second part of that question, basis in law. I mean, what dictates state statute and, and uh, violation of those statutes or the city violation of, of liquor license? How does that really all work? Honestly, I asked if we should make a, an ordinance. Uh, Mr. Bond said, well, you can do, you really don't need one. If, but personally, I, would, I don't have a problem making an ordinance that's going to stick. But Mr. Bond. Well, you have an ordinance. You have a liquor code already that provides penalties, maximum penalties. What you want to do is you want to give the, uh, the mayor as the liquor commissioner the maximum latitude uh, to impose uh, the appropriate fine. So rather than having him stuck with determinative sentence or fines, he has a right to go up to a certain threshold. So if it's a very severe but first offense, let's say you've got a 10-year-old goes in there and uses it. Well, that may be a first offense, but that's much more severe than if you've got a 20-year-old who's going to be 21 in two days. Uh, you know, so there, the mayor needs to have that, that luxury and that latitude. And currently, under your current ordinance, there's a penalty provision for violation of the uh, terms and conditions of their liquor license, and there's also a uh, the ability of the mayor to suspend and revoke those uh, those licenses. The dis distinction between state statute, there are certain things that can be prosecuted under state statute. That's the the gaming act itself, and the police do that enforcement. And there's other things that the can be enforced under the city code, such as violations of their liquor license uh, uh, provisions that uh, legally can be prosecuted by the city under uh, under uh, the city code. And it has, again, its own set of penalties uh, already with it. Alderman Woods, follow up? Yeah, I, th I think I'll expand the question maybe. Um, to your point that the 10 year old that's caught in there gambling. Well, that's really not necessarily a violation of the liquor laws, although it is a violation of the state, I guess, gaming laws. So can we as a, a municipality then take the stance, as you're saying, the mayor find them under the liquor laws, which really weren't <coughs> violated? Actually, they, they were violated because under our liquor code, it says any violation of state statute. So we've encompassed Although this law didn't exist, we've encompassed that into our, our uh, local liquor, our liquor co uh, code. So our liquor code contemplates if you have a violation uh, of state statute, that impacts your uh, liquor license. So it's already there. It's a, it's a twofer. Anytime if somebody were, were there, you've got a uh, potential. So if somebody sells for underage drinking, that clerk who sold to the uh, individual who's underage uh, can be charged criminally for that under state statute. The owner, the business license holder, can also be charged under the city code for one of his employees violating state statute. Mr. Woods, follow up. Go ahead. Um, so if the, the statute was violated, and I'm assuming there's different time frames on state cases versus a municipal case, do both have to be answered? How fast can we act in closing that business down or finding that business? And do we have to wait till both cases at different levels come to fruition or, or an answer is achieved? Mr. Bond. No, there is a uh, provision we have to give notice and under our code, I believe it's 10 day notice to the uh, business owner. They are entitled to a hearing before the mayor uh, for violations of liquor code. Uh, I'd like to say as a uh, former prosecutor, I'd like to say that the uh, state charges could be prosecuted as quickly, but as a practical matter, that's just not very realistic. So we do not have to wait until the completion of the prosecution of the underlying uh, criminal act, uh, the mayor has the ability 
to hear evidence and make a determination. It's a different standard. The legal standard if, for a violation of state statute is uh, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, in the civil matter of the liquor license, it's a preponderance of the evidence, a significantly different standard, a much lighter burden uh, for the city to prosecute claims against a uh, liquor license holder for violations. And it's got a much quicker timeline uh, and can be expedited. The mayor can make the determination after hearing the evidence, he can make the determination on the spot. He can enter an order with a, a fine or with a suspension or revocation and that's, uh, that's effective immediately. Thank you. Alderman Wesley. My question, I really would love to see the ordinance drawn up on this for we know exactly what this could could do. I mean, because really, because let's take for instance, and I'm, believe me, I'm not picking any businesses here. But my question is, we have a, a driving range place here that there's a lot of young people that come in and out of that place. We have hotels in this town that's got a liquor license they pour. You know, I I just think we need to see an ordinance adopted and see how what where the fines are and all that. Okay, because I'll tell you one thing. If we change mayor leadership down the line here, that could all change on that because the liquor commissioner and mayor changes. Therefore, if we have an ordinance in place, the mayor, even though he's a liquor commissioner, he's got to obey the ordinance that we pass as a city council. Mr. Bond. You, you can't, you cannot impose a fine that does not exist in state statute. The city does not have the authority to trump state statute. I, I mean, I agree with you. I think that would be great, but you don't have the legal authority to do that. The only thing you have, and if you wanna revisit your, your, your code, your liquor code, you certainly could do that and impose fines for, if you wanna step up the, uh, the amount of the fines for your uh, liquor violations, but you've already got a pretty steep uh, fine system for your liquor code violations. I, in, in my opinion, and, and representing a number of municipalities, uh, the city of Wooddale's got a, uh, a, a very solid uh, fine structure in its uh, liquor code and has got a, a very solid enforcement mechanism. But you do not have the authority, as the city of Wooddale, you do not have the authority to impose fines or penalties in excess of what the, uh, the state has provided for in state statute under the Gaming Act. You just don't have that authority. Still like to see the ordinance on it. I still like to see the ordinance drop. I, we have two. two Alderman Coles, you had, you had a people, comment. We have two people that want to talk. Okay, somebody wants to speak again. Go ahead, Mr. Malone. I just wonder, Mr. Bond, if you could speak to uh, what the penalties are in the state statute for this this uh, video gaming. Mr. It depends on the nature of the uh, of the offense. There are several penalty provisions in there. Some of those are through the uh, state. If you violate the license, there's a couple of the, the several different tiers to that that don't impact the city. But if the uh, the the manufacturer of the uh, of the gaming machine has to have certain licenses, there's penalties for that. If somebody's using a a license a machine that is not licensed by the state, there's a penalty for that. And then you've got state statute penalties for violations if someone is under the age of 21. Well, that's what I, mainly that one. I, I uh, think the, the machines are going to be, from what I understand, very strictly built and, and provided to us. And, and, and I think the, the regulations that each liquor license holder has to provide um, about never having a felony and so on and so forth there are, are all things that you have to go for before you even get the machines. And, and I'm just wondering if, say, somebody did come in and use it and somebody caught you and you had a violation like that, wouldn't you automatically lose the license from the state in the first place? Totally. I mean, I'm, a, I'm my understanding is you had something like that happen, you would lose it and you probably wouldn't get it back. Mr. I may be wrong, but that's true. Uh, generally with the, the offense you're talking about is a, is a $500 fine, but there is a provision in there that it, it create goes up to a, a, a class four felony uh, for different violations. So, I mean, I could go through this, this, this section with respect to the penalties and the different nature of violations is fairly significant. I just I think it might reassure some of them yeah. on what they're voting for if they know how strict the state's trying to be. So, And again, you've got failure to display signs. You've got failure to segregate it. There's a lot of different violations within that 
uh, and get, oper you know, utilizing a machine that doesn't have the proper uh, information uh, for having someone who's not, you know, regulating. So there's a number of different violations contained within the statute. Those violations carry with them different fines, ranging from a misdemeanor offense to a uh, to a felony offense, depending on the nature of the violation. And Mr. Ben. I mean, the state's all over it, but I'm not going to jeopardize my liquor license to make anything on those machines. I make my money from my liquor license, and I'm going to protect it with my life. So, Mr. I mean, I'm it, going to isolate those machines. Somebody's going to watch those machines. They're just, I mean, you're a bad businessman if you violate that. And again, the, one of the preconditions for the issuance of a video gaming license was that it had to be a, a, an establishment that was licensed and had a, a liquor license, and it's only a limited category of those who have a liquor license. And the belief was in the discussion, the legislative debate on the issue was that, uh, much as the gentleman indicated, that those businesses are going to do what they can to protect their liquor license. They're not going to jeopardize that liquor license so that's going to give a certain sense of control and enforcement uh, oversight for that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they, the state had the wisdom, and oftentimes we can debate the state's wisdom, but in this instance, the state had the wisdom to restrict the categories or classifications of individuals who are eligible to receive those, uh, those gaming machines to businesses that have a liquor license, knowing that the local municipalities all have their own liquor code and have the ability and very very uh, uh, broad flexibility to impose very significant fines, again, up to a revocation of the liquor license for those establishments that violate state statute and violate that gaming act. Anything further? Alderman Lozara. <clears throat> Pat, just for clarification, can a, an establishment lose their machines without losing their liquor license. Mr. Bond. Absolutely. There's a whole series of different things. Everything from, it wouldn't be a violation of their liquor license not to have a display sticker on the machine. But that would be a violation of the license for the video gaming and the state can revoke that uh, from them without having an impact on the, uh, on the liquor license. Alderman Woods. Well, who's gonna enforce all these nice rules that the state made up do they have a policing arm or, or oversight group mr bond the gaming board is uh going to oversee that and then the local enforcement though is going to be from the police i mean if they see someone in that area or they get a report from a patron that there's an individual in that area who's underage or that there's a, a, a machine in there that is not licensed uh the police have the authority they have jurisdiction to go in and determine whether or not it's a violation the licensing, uh, again, as, as the gentleman indicated, there is a very stringent uh, licensing uh, uh, criteria that they're going to go through before they even are eligible to receive a license from the state, and the state's going to monitor that and oversee it. But a lot of the enforcement's going to come from the local police departments. Alderman Lazar. This is for the chief. On, on that note, can you... Um, Tell us what kind of complications you think that might be, policing this? Well, it, our anticipation is to handle this like we do alcohol or uh, tobacco. Uh, with those, we do do underage stings that we proactively, uh, one is under a grant, one is just on our own uh, to go in and uh, check the businesses to make sure they're not selling alcohol or, or uh, tobacco to minors. Uh, we would do the same thing with this type of thing. Uh, in addition, uh, weekly, daily, several times a week, we go into different bars and pull bar check numbers that we walk through the bar, make sure there's no one underage drinking. Uh, we would do that with the gambling too. So we would handle it. Uh, there would be the regular undercover checks, but they go on on a weekly basis too at the different, different establishments. So we'd continue to do that. Follow up, Mr. Lazaro. So you don't see this as being more manpower or more, more hours? No. Okay, thank you. Mr. Butis, you want to make a comment? Number one, these machines that we get or any establishment, any establishment that they're going to get is by a supplier. 
We have my pull tab supplier, which is LBC. I've gotten all my pull tabs and all my gambling tickets from them, my bingo tickets from them. There's another outfit, K and R, that does that, that handles my um, my two machines that are on the, one's on a bar and one's on a table, and also my uh, my uh, record machine that plays everything. They they are they are sanctioned by the state. They have to come in and put the machines in there, and all of the wiring, is, all of this is hooked up directly to Springfield. Everything in that machine, every dollar goes, the, re, the report goes all the way to Springfield. So they know when they have the machine, a guy puts $2 in there, Springfield knows it, that it came from this machine, that number of machine. So as far as the machines are concerned, they're coming from a st regular uh, establishments that are sanctioned by the state. These are not people just throwing machines in because we could have had something like that before ourselves a long time ago because you could have put, put them in there and of course we know it's against the law, that's why we never did it. But uh, these machines are all going to be hooked up with the state so every dollar that goes in is registered in the state. And the other thing is that uh, before they ever start, all the machines are going to be in place before anybody can really use them they're going to have to have one big tryout so that everything feeds into the state at one time. How they intend to do it, I have no idea, but before anybody can make a dime on it, all the machines at one time have to be plugged in and all the information goes into the state. And if everything works out okay, then we're everybody's sanctioned to go ahead and use the machines then. So this is states keeping a good eye on all this stuff, especially on the money and everything else. It's our job to watch who gets in to play the machines. And that's, that's going to be a hard job because there's going to be a bunch of young kids coming into it, sometimes a phony, a phony driver's license or something like that. It's going to be hard to watch, but we're going to try it. I've been playing, I've been paying uh, Uncle Sam, or the state, I should say, for the last 16 years over here and also in Bensonville. Every three months, every quarter, I give them $10,000. They take 5%, 5.15%. Right off the top of any prize that I get. So they get their money, they make sure they get their money first. So they make sure that everything, with what we do is up and up so that we can't cheat because if anybody complains about our bingo or about our pull tabs, they have a representative that comes over there and checks us out and they find out what's going on. So I had it happen to me one time because somebody complained because they, they uh, wanted to have, we had a game that, uh, a pull tab game. We had one ticket as a $500 ticket. The owner, whoever had that ticket, threw it away, lost it or whatever, and the people wanted to have another number called, and I said no because there's only one winner in the game, so I had to call the state to find out what the, what the remedy of that is, and there's only one, one winner, that's it. So I have to, what do I happen with the money? I got $500, I don't know what to do with it, I can't pull another ticket. So they say you have to hold it for three years, and if nobody claims it, <laughs> it's yours. But uh, Uncle Sam is watching us, okay? Thank you. Alderman Woods? Yeah, it was uh, my understanding, actually, it's a company in uh, upstate New York that got the contract to monitor the systems. It doesn't go to Springfield. It's a third-party person who got a six-year contract that $69 million, I think it was, but so there is monitoring. It's it not necessarily firsthand by the state, um, but I wanted to bring up uh, one more thing, and that's the uh, thing that nobody's talked about uh, at this meeting, and that's the residents of Wooddale. I, I've went around and, and talked to quite a few of them, uh, and for the most part, uh, I would say 95% of them are opposed to having uh, the gambling in, in in the city, so I just when we take this vote, I'm conflicted a little bit. You know, I understand the business's point of view. I understand that there's some controls, and you know, I'm not worried about all the business owners that we have in town. They've been here for years. We trust you. It's the guy coming in after you, the guy coming in next year or two years from today. And as one of the aldermen brought up, when we have a new mayor, if that happens. Nunzio's probably going to be here for 20 years, but getting rid of me let's say already. we do. <laughs> he does get yeah. replaced. You know, those are the concerns, not the people that we're looking at. You guys have worked hard in the community, and 
uh, done a lot for the community, and that doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, it's all the un unknowns, and, and again, listening to the residents, too. So uh, when we're voting on this, just keep those in, in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Coles. I got, I got something to say about that, too. Uh, I realize that the people here, some of the people don't want gambling. But do they realize that if you don't want gambling, you better take your uh, computers and put them away. You better go to all your stores that have uh, lotto tickets and put them away because 